the idea that I want to develop is that uh, good investing is a little bit like diagnosing mental illnesses <laughs> because you have to understand uh, the pricing of assets to find something that is underpriced for now and will improve later. So that means understanding the, the origins of people's thinking. So it puts you in closer to a psychiatrist than you might like to think. Now in my books, Irrational Exuberance, I have it in three editions. Uh, they're all shown there. Uh, the first edition, 2000, the second, 2005, and the third, 2015. I talk about uh, investing as very much tied to psychology, that the movements in financial markets are very psychologically oriented. Well, I was part of a movement in the finance profession called behavioral finance, which has been developing now for a couple of decades. One theme that I made in all three editions of the book is that a psychological literature on the narrative basis for human thinking is very important for finance. So I'm, th I'm thinking of um, Abelson and Shank, for example, they're psychologists. They said the human brain is wired for stories, especially human interest stories. And so movements in asset prices are the result of contagion of stories. The problem is that markets are inefficient in a evolving story sense, that they, uh, big events happen rarely, there's massive turning points that suddenly come. Something may appear statistically to be sound, but if it doesn't have a sound foundation in behavioral finance, it may suddenly end. Precipitating factors are what gets the bubble started. Usually there's many precipitating factors too many to tell a simple story, so we end up being bewildered by why now? Why are we having a bubble now? These precipitating factors tend to be stories, often human interest stories. Well, sometimes they're naive theories that, that can be told quickly like a, um, tr a trope. Then they reach epidemic proportion with an amplification mechanism. Price-to-price -price feedback when the stock price, let's say it's a stock, starts going up, it attracts attention. It attracts attention to stories that might explain the price increase, even if they have nothing to do with the price increase. Then they achieve currency, and they, end in, they enter the collective consciousness. And then it repeats again and again for a while. This is bubble. Price to GDP to price feedback is analogous. When the price of stocks goes up, people spend more, GDP goes up, that encourages people to think again that the good times are coming and prices go up again. And then price to corporate earnings to price feedback. When stock price goes up, people spend more, corporate earnings go up <laughs> as a reaction. The chart shows the real Standard & Poor composite stock price in, or the S&P 500 since 1957. Uh, I have it plotted back to 1871, reflecting my sense that you need to understand the long sweep of history before you have any real understanding. Uh, the green, the blue line is the real U.S. stock market value, uh, well, well, value of an investment. The green line is the earnings per share on, on uh, the stock market. The thing that jumps out at me is that there are some rare big events that uh, are so rare that we can't do a statistical analysis. We can't be systematic. This is the millennium peak. The Dow Jones Industrial Average peaked in January of 2000, one month after we changed the first digit of our year from one to two, an event that occurs once every, two, every thousand years. And it led to a lot of talk at the time about the future and about the wonderful things that were coming. Now, I, it may not be common for most people to think that stories like that drive markets, but I believe they do. It was a futuristic mode, an optimistic time. The internet came in then as well. So I'll call that the millennium boom. This boom here, I call the ownership society boom. 
uh, from a phrase that was popular. Well, George Bush, the U.S. president, used it in the 2004 election as a campaign slogan. The idea that we're all becoming capitalists, we're all becoming owners, and that this is driving a prosperity. The latest boom, which you can see from 2009 to the present, uh, I call the new normal boom, or, or you might also call it the uh, secular stagnation boom. It doesn't seem to have the same excitement about it. Uh, it's a different story. It's more of a sense of pessimism that's dry, but it, it may seem paradoxical that we would have a boom at this time. And then now the, uh, the latest boom, the new normal boom. Why are asset prices in the stock market and in real estate markets and, and the bond market jumping up so much in recent years? We had a depression scare in around the financial crisis. Many uh, prime ministers were, pundits were, were talking about the risk that the world would fall into another depression. We got out of that. But we got out of it with extremely loose monetary policy and quantitative easing in various places around the world. I also, in the book, bring out other things that I, most people don't mention in connection with securities prices. It's not all just central bankers and depression scares. And I think another thing that's driving asset prices up now is a, uh, is a fear about technology. And that is that the last five years or so have seen the most dramatic increases in information technology. We are now carrying around supercomputers in our pockets. Uh, computers that will translate from Chinese into English if you want. Uh, will tell you, you can ask your cell phone, where am I? And it will show you a map with a little dot uh, where exactly you are. And you can say, I'm hungry. <laughs> to your cell phone, and it will tell you a direction to the nearest restaurant. I think this is scaring people. It's leading to a, a, a sense of a different world that is much riskier for individuals than it used to be. And it's also an unequal world. And this is another thing. I think fear of inequality is, is amplifying now. The point is that now this might seem to be a reason for prices to be low, but I think it's quite the contrary, that when people are afraid, they want to save more, and they cut back their spending, which weakens the economy, but at the same time, they bid up prices of assets.